Hello, Frank. How are you doing? Good. Hello, Tiago. Hello. We are live. And uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure and honor to me to introduce Frank. Uh, I'll try to spell it right. I, I learned from time that's Frank Kielsen, right? Yeah, Frank? yeah that's fine. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Frank Kielsen. So uh, Frank, he, so he's a chemist. He graduated at SDU in, in, in Denmark, UNSE, and he did his PhD in Roman Zubarev's lab in Karolinska Institute. So you probably are familiar about the lab, uh, mm -hmm. his big proteomics lab too. And he used to work a lot in trying to understand the fundamental uh, mechanisms of how peptides fragmentate in ion phase, right, Frank? That's so correct. With uh, electron and induction, right? Yeah. I think you, you developed the E, uh, what was the name again? E -C -D. Electron capture dissociation. Ca electron cap ECD. Yes. Electron capture dissociation. And, uh, it's yeah. sibling with the electron transfer dissociation, which is more known today. Exactly, exactly. So after quite a few years there, so he stayed in, in Sweden from 2001, 2006, right? Yeah. And then uh, he got a, a really nice uh, grant from Novo Nordisk, if I'm not mistaken. From the uh, Danish Institute. Danish. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. Danish Institute Council. Uh, so it's a Stino grant in 2009. And then he became associate professor at the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of Southern Denmark, uh, which was then when I met him because I. I I went to Denmark in 2009, and end of 2009. First, I, I, I worked with Peter Hubstuff, but then, then uh, Frank, uh, uh, 2000, from 2011 on, I worked in, in Frank's lab, in Frank's group. So it was like a really, really nice time that we had together. We used to, yes. we used to have like a lot of traveling from Denmark to, to Germany, right? Yeah. To have meetings, it was like really fun. A lot of good talks. And uh, well, then he got uh, a really, really important uh, grant as well. So Frank is really good in getting grants. <laughs> I wish I had learned from him. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he got like the, the ERC, the European Research Council, to as a consolidator award to, to, to consolidate your group. So then, of course, he, he, his group uh, get, got bigger and bigger and bigger. He became a professor. It's, it's a full professor, right, Frank? Correct, yeah, full professor, yeah. Now he's full professor at the, the BMB, the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology from Stockholm Denmark University. And yeah, so he, he's basically working, he's still working a little bit on the, trying to understand the fragmentation techniques he, he's doing a lot of uh, work in, in nanoparticles, so try to understand how the nanoparticles interact with each other. He's doing, and I know that as because his background in chemists, and he knows a lot of that, so he's also like trying to develop new methods using uh, what is called metal proteomics, and also trying to use this, these techniques to develop a new method to enrich for PTMs, things like that. So um, I'm not taking longer time. It's uh, Frank's time. I just want to say you again that I'm really happy that you accepted this invitation. I'm really, really happy that you, you can share a bit more about, about your work. So it's, it's your time now, Frank. Yeah, thank you very much, Tiago. It's a pleasure to... Uh... To accept this invitation, uh, I'm happy to uh, tell what I know about uh, use of uh, proteomics in uh, assessing the interaction between nanoparticles and uh, biological systems such as cells and organs. So this is what the talk is about. Uh, but I think uh, before we dig deeper into uh, the proteomics part, it's nice to 
get a grip on what nanoparticles are and why they are used in our society. So uh, nanoparticle technology is a fantastic area that has fascinated me for years now because uh, the fascination lies in the fact that, that the properties that you have in bulk material when they are degraded down to uh, nano size, which uh, per definition is uh, particles in the range of one to a hundred nanometer, they change their physical and chemical properties. And there's basically an endless uh, possibility to generate all sorts of nanoparticles of different material and composition and, and alloys and so forth. And over the years, uh, researchers have demonstrated uh, a, a huge range of application fields. So this is a technology that is uh, come to stay and uh, I bet it will have a transforming power to our society and how we live our lives. Uh, I just listed here a number of uh, application fields and um, there are many interesting ones. One is in, in uh, diagnostics and treatment of diseases because a number of diseases like many of the diseases of the brain is difficult to, to treat because of the blood brain, brain barrier that is difficult to pass for, for different um, drugs. But uh, putting drugs into nanoparticles may be the way forward to treat uh, these diseases. There are many other possibilities where you can use nanoparticle technology in, in, uh, in the clinic. Also, the surface area of nanoparticles is, of course, uh, uh, combined larger than just the bulk material. And with new uh, catalytic properties, they can be used, for instance, to waste management, but also many other possibilities are available. Uh, silver nanoparticles, in particular, has, have shown to be antimicrobial. Uh, so they simply kill bacteria and are used in in bandage and, and other products. But I would say already at this point, the use of them should be uh, uh, made in a way when, when it's necessary to apply this. Then um, hardness, uh, you can make uh, material with a very uh, strong uh, tolerance to, to, to stress and so forth. The electron band gap, which describes uh, uh, or which is important to generate solar panels can be modified with nanoparticles, electrical properties, magnetic properties, and you can you can make new materials that are better than what we know. So this is just uh, some of the applications so you can understand that this is an important field. Uh, and uh, just uh, to give you an impression about the market value, I found this prediction that was made in 16 on just uh, nanotechnology within uh, or, yeah nanotechnology in in bio in the bio field and uh, this year it was predicted that it would range up to 42 billion dollars so so it's a it's a huge market too so this this is definitely important uh, on the other side and uh, it's often like that with with new technologies uh, we have seen this in, 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 in history that uh, development can go so fast that we uh, also forget about safety. And this is where I think uh, my group can contribute. And I think it's an important area uh, because uh, there has been a lot of concern actually from, from uh, governmental organizations, especially here in the EU, which I know best, there's a lot of concern about uh, unintentional uh, exposure to these nanoparticles because they are found in, in, as I said, in many different products and they are released to the environment and what happens then and, and what does it mean when humans, animals and plants are exposed to these particles. So to me, what I wrote down here, this is very important. I mean, I, I will fight for sustainable nanotechnology by applying proteomics and investigating how uh, nanoparticles can impact uh, human health. Um, there's a lot of product as, as mentioned, and, and I tried to, to look up if I could find references to that. And I found this one that 
Although it stops at 15, you can see there's a steady increase in number of products containing nanoparticles. And uh, I just got the recent number from 2020. And today, there are more than 5,000 products that you can buy uh, containing nanoparticles, at least claiming containing nanoparticles. Uh, these 5,000, this data comes from this database called the Nano Database, which is very interesting. And I can advise anyone with interest in this field to visit it. You can uh, make a lot of different distribution searches. And I did some, which is shown here. Um, I, what I want to show here is really two things that I find uh, notable. Uh, the first thing is actually uh, something that I find quite uh, disturbing. And that is, I would say this is three fourth, uh, three quarters of all the parts of all the uh, products. They uh, they are not well described actually in terms of what nanoparticles then contain. Uh, so they they contain no information about size, distribution, uh, shape, uh, com uh, what compound it is, and so forth. So for consumers, this is difficult to navigate in. Uh, the other part is uh, then uh, where we have knowledge. And as you can see, the black uh, pie here or piece is uh, silver. And uh, so it takes up quite some space in the nano product world. And uh, I have also, uh, for that reason, done some studies uh, with silver nanoparticles. All right, uh, so here we have uh, uh, um, a distribution of where silver nanoparticles are mainly used. As you can see, the majority of the products are within health and fitness and uh, garden and home uh, uh, appliances uh, contains also food and beverages and so forth, even uh, goods for children. So there, there's a wide, also wide distribution, but health and fitness takes up most of the, the um, distribution. Um, I want to show you something, uh, some of the products that are, you can find on the internet. Uh, and this is uh, uh, with silver nanoparticles. And silver, as I said, has been known for, for centuries to be antimicrobial. And uh, especially uh, uh, in the nano size, they work very well. Uh, so you can find a lot of gels. You can even find uh, solutions that you're supposed to drink every day. And I don't know if you can see this, but it says it supports your immune system. I will say and stress this by now, I would never, ever uh, use any uh, of these products uh, because uh, silver is really a toxic metal. And uh, I don't believe there's any documentation that it will support your immune system. Uh, you can argue that if you have wounds that will not heal and you have tried everything, I mean, diabetic people have poor circulation of, of, your, of their blood and this can prohibit uh, wound healing. Uh, you can have bandages with uh, silver uh, material and also gel that, that can help in this. But, but then again, we're talking about situations where it really makes a difference. I don't think this is something you should just use uh, from time to time. Uh, there's also a lot of fabrics with nano uh, particles uh, on the market. And the uh, idea here is to remove a bad odor so there's a lot of athletic uh, clothing, uh, jogging outfits, and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, I can tell that in EU, these products are banned from 2020. Uh, you cannot sell uh, textiles with, with uh, nano uh, silver. But there's uh, many other products uh, uh, you can find. Uh, bottles for, for children uh, with nano silver, uh, a frying pan. And, and I just checked this morning, you can, and this is probably relevant in these days, uh, you can actually buy face masks uh, with nano silver. Um, again, I would not do that. Um, and I, I, I'm really in doubt about their documentation and approval from the health uh, uh, organizations in their countries. But apparently they are sold and, and you can get them shipped. So you can see there's a lot of uh, different products uh, and uh, therefore we are exposed to these particles. 
um, it's quite common to actually spray refrigerators with thin uh, silver film. Uh, again, the argument is the same to, to remove bad odor and prevent uh, bacterial growth. A few years back, Samsung launched a washing machine uh, claiming to release uh, silver ions during uh, the washing of the clothes. Um, I have not seen uh, how this works, but this is the claim. It, it had a few comments from different organizations uh, 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 advising consumers not to buy this product. Um, but uh, I'm not here to just uh, downplay a nanotechnology all in all. As I said in the beginning, there are really a lot of uh, potential uh, good applications of nanotechnology. My point is just that we should use them in a wise manner. And now I want to show you some interesting things uh, from, from the literature. This is a um, uh, description of how one could use magnetic nanoparticles to cure tumor uh, or to, to kill tumors in, in the body. So the, the idea is to, uh, to inject a patient with nano, uh, magnetic nanoparticles that are functionalized in a way that they recognize the surface of a tumor cell. So this is uh, a brilliant idea. And then after some time, you will use uh, MRR scan to ensure that these uh, nanoparticles are then taken up by the cancer cells, after which you will expose the patient to a strong alternating magnetic field. And because the particles are magnetic, they will shake a lot, which will uh, induce hypothermia and basically boil and kill these um, uh, tumor cells. So this is a, a very interesting, and, and I'm sure that uh, um, uh, treatments like this will, will be uh, quite common someday. Uh, the researchers tried this on mice uh, that had cancer, and as you can see, uh, it really made a difference to, to, to the mice after treatment. Here's a, a very simple experiment suggested by other researchers. So, uh, as said, silver nanoparticles kill bacteria. And here they have grown two different types. One is Staphylococcus aureus. And this is, you can see here in B, this is the control. You have bacterial growth. Um, silver nanoparticles kill these bacteria. And they made a variant of those that are magnetic. And um, so this is written in Danish, I apologize. Um, but they also have the same effect. So the idea was then to, uh, to have a different way in treating uh, platelets in, in hospitals. Uh, there are patients that need transfusions of platelets and, and they, the idea is not to transfer bacteria from one uh, donor to a patient because they're already vulnerable. And today you shine this uh, solution with UV light, but this damage also the proteins of the solution. So. Uh, the suggestion here is to inject these magnetic nanoparticles after which they kill the bacteria and you can retain them with a magnet. Um, I don't know if this has come into practice, but this is another idea at least. So you can imagine that uh, there's many routes of exposure. Uh, we can ingest them. We can uh, inhale nanoparticles. They are so light, they, they can uh, stay in the air too. Uh, they can traverse our skin or we can become injected with them. And, and as they enter the body, they will have a, a roots of biodistribution and reach different organs. So it's quite complex to understand what happens actually to these nanoparticles after they enter the body and what impact do they have to different organs. Uh, so this is uh, the interest field of my group. And um, as you know, uh, cells are not static or enclosed uh, containers. They really uh, interact with the environment, uh, up, uh, taking up uh, nutrition, releasing uh, uh, waste products, uh, communicating with other cells. So there's a lot of things going on in a cell. And what we know by now is that 
as a nanoparticle enter the bloodstream or any other biological fluid containing proteins and other biomolecules, uh, a decoration will happen around a nanoparticle called, yeah, funny enough, corona. So this is termed a protein corona. So this is proteins from our body decorating a particle. And this will work as a stealth for the nanoparticle. So it's difficult for our body to recognize nanoparticles as foreign objects because they just have our own proteins and lipids uh, around them. So we're interested in understanding how this corona is formed um how particles are taken up and and what impact they do in fact it's quite natural as mentioned for cells to to take up uh, particles of 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 the nano size uh because uh it has been known for many years that cells produce micro vesicles and exosomes and uh, they are small uh, units packed with DNA and proteins and, and other uh, molecules. And, and a recipient cell can easily uh, take uh, these uh, particles uh, into them. Uh, so, so systems are already in place in our cells for engulfing uh, particles in the nano range. So, so this is probably uh, one of the problems with these nanoparticles. Uh, how to investigate uh, uh, the impact. There are a, a, a range of traditional uh, typical methods. Uh, for one, uh, imaging uh, using different types of microscopy. And uh, it gives you a, a good indication. As you can see, the green dots here are actually silver nanoparticles. These are uh, uh, data from a study by Tiago, uh, the host now. and. And uh, there are other uh, techniques that we apply, a range of biochemical assays, uh, cell viability, ROS, uh, ATP content, and, and many other uh, uh, assays. And, and they are good in telling a lot about the toxicity. Is it toxic or not? Uh, but it doesn't say much about why or how. And this is where we think uh, we can do a lot in the future. Uh, and uh, we like omics technologies. We think they can can uh, uh, answer uh, much more uh, precisely why and how nanoparticles interact with our cells. We apply proteomics uh, because it can give us information about protein-protein networks and enriched biological pathways. So our working hypothesis is actually that if this sustainable nanote uh, nanotechnology is to be achieved, it requires comprehensive insight into this nanobio interactions, and we will provide this with proteomics analysis. So this is where we stand uh, today. As mentioned, uh, it's it's good to have different uh, 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 methods to assess toxicity, uh, and we apply all of them. But uh, this talk will be uh, primarily on uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, we apply also quantitative proteomics. And just to remind you what the quantity of proteins can allow us to say, it's, it's pretty general, but it's also applied to nanobio studies. And um, I shown here a, um, a map of my hometown uh, to the left, Odense. And it's just to, to sort of uh, make the um, resemblance. Every city has a power plant. It's uh, the power plant, plant of the cell is the mitochondria. It has a city wall that could be the membrane. The nucleus could be city hall and the hospital could be proteins related to detoxification. Production or construction industry is the ribosomes. And, and there's many sort of uh, funny resemblance. Uh, the point is here that if you know, let's say in a city that the city hired twice as many uh, workers to the power plant, you will deduce from that that the city is lacking energy and, and now that will be taken care of. The same is going for cells. So we, we're counting proteins uh, involved in different functions. And in that way, we can tell uh, what um, 
what uh, what the cell is doing in order to uh, cope with any perturbation and that perturbation could be from a nano uh, exposure study so this is basically what we're doing uh, is there a way to say something general about uh, the response um, we have done a number of studies by now and um, uh, there are many resemblance but they are also uh, uh, unique um, um, observations and I will say that it really depends on the cell type, uh, the size of particles, dose and exposure duration. But it's sure by now that nanoparticles can enter the cell. Some will stay also for some time in the membrane, but, but many of them will eventually be taken up by the cell. We know they interact and, and mingle or disturb the function of, of the mitochondria, which raises the uh, amount of ROS. ROS is a uh, reactive oxygen species, can form radicals that, that can lead to apoptosis. It can also uh, lead, I mean, it, it, it increases the oxidative stress leading to protein oxidation that will either misfold and function ro wrong or, or be degraded. We have seen a number of proteins uh, being upregulated to battle this oxidative stress, so antioxidant proteins. We have seen metabolic adaption and transcription factor activation. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of um, a range of, of, of um, effects from these nanoparticles, and, and I'll give some examples of individual studies. The first I'll talk about is an idea we got, um, I think, two years back. Uh, because uh, most of the studies in the literature is about how uh, organs or cells are uh, behaving after being exposed to one type of a nanoparticle. We were thinking as humans and, and other individ uh, uh, um, uh, individuals, we are living in a world uh, not exposed just by one type of nanoparticle. We, we're probably exposed to many different types. We're also exposed to other contaminants. So in this study, we wanted to understand whether exposure of one nanoparticle and another contaminant would um, have any synergy. And uh, so one common uh, contaminant that, that most humans are exposed to is cadmium. Cadmium comes from the dirt and is heavily released from cement production and mining and is released um, and spread around the whole globe. So we are directly uh, exposed to cadmium uh, uh, from the air, soil, and water, but certainly also from our food, where we get 90% of our exposure uh, unless we are uh, smokers. Smokers have 10 times higher content of cadmium because tobacco plants have a uh, preference for accumulating cadmium. So smokers really have uh, a lot of cadmium in their body. It has a long uh, half-life in our body and it toxic primarily to the liver and kidney. So in this study, we decided to study uh, liver cells. So we made a simple experiment where we grew uh, uh, liver cells, Hep G2, it's a cancer liver cell line. So we had a control experiment. We had one uh, exposed just to silver nanoparticles, one to cadmium ions, and then the combination of them. So we wanted to study a synergy, and synergy uh, exists if, if the effect is larger than the sum of the individual uh, uh, experiments. And what we saw here was a very strong indication because uh, the viability drop uh, in silver nanoparticles was about 25%. It was uh, about 10% for, for cadmium, but the combination resulted in something like 70% drop in viability, so a dramatic effect, uh, which was quite disturbing. We wanted to investigate with proteomics what was going on, and we found several distinct uh, pathways that were regulated, but Primarily, what caught our main interest was that uh, the observation that basically all the enzymes of glycolysis was downregulated. 
including uh, enzymes uh, responsible for pentose phosphate pathway. All this was downregulated, which uh, leads, you know, uh, which was also confirmed to lead to a, a immediate uh, reduction in ATP generation. Uh, we saw then uh, adaption to that ATP depression uh, by raising the, the burn of fatty acids and uh, the activity of the TCA cycle and electron transport chain. So the cell tried to adapt to uh, less production of ATP from glycolysis by, by raising the activity of other parts of the metabolism. Um, but it's quite, it can be quite um, devastating to, uh, for, for a liver not to be able to perform glycolysis. And I, I brought this picture just to remind you uh, the function of the liver in terms of uh, processing glucose. After a meal, we know the level of glucose is high, which promote excretion of insulin. And the liver plays a central role in 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 um, in, in metabolizing uh, glucose. It performs a glycolysis, which leads to generation of ATP. If there are plenty of energy uh, excess, uh, acetyl CoA will be a trend uh, 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 will be made to uh, triacyl glycerol, which is basically fat, and transported to adipose tissue. Uh, so, so it plays a major role in, in, in liver. But I should say also that glycolysis plays play a major role in all organs. So uh, if this is the situation for liver, maybe uh, other tissues are also hurt by, by cadmium and, and, uh, and the silver nanoparticles. Um, it may become even worse between meals because between meals, we have to remember that the liver is the main responsible organ for stabilizing the blood uh, glucose concentration to about five millimolar. And it does so by breaking down glucogen, which is basically a storage of glucose, but it only have a limited reservoir. If we don't eat in between that, it has to make a process called gluconeogenesis, which is the synthesis of glucose from, from uh, other components like amino acids or glycerol. But the important part here is that in glyconeogenesis, it utilizes seven out of the 10 enzymes of glycolysis because it's the reverse process. So if these proteins are inhibited or in less concentration, uh, we have a problem uh, in, in stabilizing this blood, uh, blood glucose concentration. Um, Inhibit, inhibiting or, or reducing the activity of the pentose phosphate pathway is also a problem. The pentose phosphate pathway does basically two things. It, it synthesizes the precursor necessary for nucleotide synthesis, but in this content, probably more important, it also makes NADPH, which is a reductive equivalent uh, that is used in many biochemical uh, uh, reactions. One of them, that are of interest in this content context is um, the reduction of uh, glutathione. Uh, and this is made by NADPH that reduces uh, uh, the dimer into free glutathione that then can be used to detoxify um, uh, radical oxygen species. And these are produced primarily from the um, uh, mitochondria here, a uh, hydrogen peroxide that can lead to uh, radicals, but gluta glutathione, which is the probably the most important antioxidant, will uh, make sure that this is transferred into water. But it cannot continue if we don't have enough NADPH. So this can be a potential problem also for the cells. So we were having data now showing that um, glycolysis is inhibited and uh, probably also NADPH. And uh, we were thinking this is quite disturbing, but maybe also interesting. We were working with uh, HEPG2 uh, cells, uh, which is a liver cancer cell. And 
And we know from Warburg uh, studies that uh, what is characteristics of cancer cells are a high flux of glucose. It really burns a lot of glucose to make the components necessary for a, a, a rapid proliferation and growth. Uh, so the consumption of glucose of these cells are much higher than normal cells, where there's a much more moderate uh, consumption of glucose. So a long-lasting goal in cancer therapy has been actually to inhibit this high rate of glucose metabolism. So we're thinking um, it's interesting to understand if the same phenomenon then exists for normal cells as we have seen for cancer cells. So we made another study and, and we exchanged cadmium to cisplatinum because cisplatin is probably uh, one of the oldest uh, chemotherapy um, drugs and uh, it's used also in liver cancer. So that makes it uh, even more relevant and we combine it with um, silver nanoparticles. So um, we wanted to understand again, is there any synergy and will a normal cell, a normal cell line and a cancer cell line behave different? So here's the data of the uh, biochemical assays uh, here on the left, a viability test. So we made a control. We made one experiment as previous with silver alone. We made one with um, uh, cisplatinum, two different concentrations, and then the combination. And uh, one needs to pay attention here because um, the, the light gray is the normal cell line. And as you can see, compared to cisplatin alone and the combination, we didn't see any drop at all in viability, but the situation is quite different uh, when we have the combination therapy uh, for the hep G2 cell. If you note uh, the viability drop with silver was what, 25% and maybe 15% with cisplatinum and it drops to about 50% here. Um, so. Uh, a strong indication, uh, again, of a synergetic effect, but only observed for the cancer cell line, which was quite interesting. In terms of ROS production, we did not see a raise either by combining the two drugs in, in the normal cell line, whereas it, it, it raised um, uh, in the uh, cancer cell line. All right. Um, so we want to understand what... Uh, what is the explanation for that? And so we we applied inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, which is a, a, a branch of mass spectrometry, particularly sensitive to measuring elements in the PBB uh, uh, sensitivity. So it can measure very accurately uh, the amount of metals and other components. So we, uh, we took cells and wanted to know how much uh, silver and uh, platinum uh, this, the cells contained. So here first, this is the cancer cell line. As you can see uh, in the combination uh, therapy, uh, we have a raise um, uh, larger than expected uh, in, in both uh, treatments, whereas we did not see an increase in the content of, of, um, of silver. But for some reason, when we combine the two, cells uh, accumulate larger amount of the cisplatinum in, in this cell line. And that could explain the higher degree of toxicity for this cell. Uh, for the normal cell line, THLE2, we did not see an increase in, in the uptake of cisplatinum. So that is probably the main difference for the observations. Uh, making proteomics, because we wanted to understand the reasoning behind the observations, we quantified about six and a half thousand uh, proteins. And uh, as you can see, uh, we, uh, we listed here all the regulated proteins, silver alone, cisplatin alone, and the combination. And uh, the number of regulated proteins simply exploded in the combination uh, um, exposure study um, with hep 2 It also raised in the THLE2 cell, although uh, we did not see any effect in the viability test. There are actually signs that that more proteins are deregulated also in the combined. The normal cell line is completely um, 
insensitive to to silver nanoparticles, which was quite astonishing too. So there's a lot of interesting uh, data here. Um, we um, we made a comparison uh, to to understand what pathways we are talking about between the two cell lines. So to the left, we have Hep G2, and then we have the normal cell line to the right. Uh, what they have in common is that, uh, again, as we have seen previous studies, energy metabolism and stress response really um, has its uh, uh, high uh, responses here. Uh, what we also see is that some of the uh, deregulation or enriched pathways are coming uh, f only from one source, like like up here we have a mitochondrial dysfunction, comes primarily from, from cisplatin, where glycolysis deregulation is probably uh, induced by silver nanoparticles, because we don't see much deregulation or any significant deregulation with cisplatin alone. So this is quite interesting too. Uh, in the normal cell line, we see a, almost a similar pattern, but to us, it was very uh, striking that the deregulation of glycolysis was not present in the normal cell line. So maybe we're seeing the same pattern here as we did in the previous study. So uh, putting them side by side, all the deregulated proteins in the combination therapy, uh, we have, uh, as you can see, a number of pathways that are unique to the HEPG2 uh, that we don't find any deregulation in, in, in THLE2 cells, which also is in line with the more sort of uh, robustness of the normal cell line. But zooming in on glycolysis and picking out all the proteins, uh, this is the 10 proteins from glycolysis, what you see is that with blue, they are basically all downregulated in the HEPG2 cell line, whereas only one of them is downregulated in THL2, and that is uh, pyruvate kinase. Uh, so it really uh, it shows the uh, similar pattern as we have observed uh, uh, with the previous uh, investigation. Uh, we also know that we have a lot of uh, ROS. Uh, we saw an increase in, in ROS, so reactive oxygen species, and if if there's not a a if if cells are not uh, scavenging these uh, uh, reactive oxygen species, it will eventually lead to uh, apoptosis and other damaging effects of a cell. So we were looking at uh, upstream regulators. So this is basically transcription factors that could explain some of this. And and nerf two, as you see, uh, which is a transcription factor that is upregulated or activated in, in, in THL2 cells, but not in, in HEPG2. And, and this is a transcription factor that is known to, to uh, activate genes, go to the nucleus, activate genes uh, uh, related to uh, scavenging uh, uh, reactive oxygen species. If we look at the protein abundances, we see in the top here, so everything from here and up is, uh, is HEPG2. And we can see that the majority of, of a number of proteins is actually downregulated. And these are proteins that are involved in uh, metabolism of, of glyothione, which is this important uh, antioxidant. They are all reduced, uh, which uh, could explain why uh, this cancer cell line is not dealing that well with the increase in reactive oxygen species. On contrary, we see a number of important proteins upregulated in the normal cell line, catalase, superoxide, dismutase, ADPH, dehydrogenase, uh, that are uh, also uh, proteins that uh, is known to, to lower the uh, oxidative stress of a cell. So we, we think that combined with other observations, this could explain why we have a uh, difference between the two cells. Uh, Tiago, I need to know if I, I mean, I can see I'm running out of time and I, I can't stop here. I, I only have a few slides left, but it's fine. It's fine. You can, you can keep going. Okay. I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, you also it's took okay. five minutes in the beginning. So yeah, uh, it's okay. Don't worry. You okay. Great. As long so, as you need. Um, uh, we are approaching the end and I, I, 
the last slides will will highlight a challenge that I see in the uh, progress of uh, applying proteomics in these nanobio studies. The, the, the complexity exists because uh, we have about 200 different cell types in our body and we have seen already how different cells uh, be, respond to uh, nanoparticle exposure. And uh, so in principle, we need to test all these cells. At the same time, on the other side, we have a huge amount of uh, nanoparticles with different size, shape, coding, material. So this matrix is just tremendous. And I'm afraid that the product, production rate of nanoparticles in our society will overweigh our possibility to make safety assessment. Uh, and we cannot do that with the current pace. We can only do that if we make uh, advancement and optimization to our workflow. Uh, we need to cut some corners and, and be more clever in our way to analyze this. So uh, my previous postdoc, Anya Billing, uh, and I uh, wanted to challenge this uh, problem by setting up a platform that could then analyze a larger amount of samples uh, in a greater speed. We uh, collaborated with this, uh, in this project with Ulla Vogel from the uh, National uh, Research Center for Working Environment. And they were uh, uh, already in their, uh, uh, having a study where they have uh, uh, intractical installation of mice uh, with, with uh, a number of nanoparticles uh, that are uh, iron and cobalt oxides because they are exploited in nanomedicine. Um, and so uh, mice were, were uh, having these particles in their lung. And after some time, uh, the lung fluid was extracted called BALF. And uh, so it contains both the proteins of the lung as well as cells recruited to the lung. And they had uh, 166 samples and we wanted to to uh, finish all analysis in four days. So the strategy was as follows. We wanted to test first our reproducibility because we were applying a new to us uh, um, instrument, a new technology of uh, chromatographic separation. Then we made a discovery phase where we took a subset of samples to investigate uh, in depth of what uh, processes were going on and from that also to generate library that we could use in our screening phase to quantify uh, uh, proteins and, and make a faster analysis. We teamed up with EvoSEP and Odense that produced this uh, uh, instrument called EvoSEP1 that can run very short gradients without uh, much dead time and without much carryover uh, so all our screenings were made with 24 minutes gradients um, and uh, those data was uh, held uh, against or, or combined and, and used uh, in combination with our discovery phase. So um, I'll move fast here. Uh, so first the uh, evaluation of EvoSet1, we, we studied uh, a protein uh, we selected six proteins that span six orders of uh, magnitude. And as you can see, uh, the technical replicates, uh, they don't deviate much. Uh, so this was very uh, rewarding. Uh, and when we measured the cross correlation between the replicates, it had an average of, of uh, uh, average coefficient of uh, 0.98, which was very good to us. And we ensured that our series was within uh, what could be expected in, in clinical research, uh, which is, has a, a common threshold of 20%. And we could have that uh, uh, with, um, with a subset of, of proteins uh, that did not have uh, any uh, miss, missing values. Uh, if we increase the number of missing values between measurements, of course, it, it goes up a little bit, but not too much, actually. I think uh, working more with this instrumentation, we can bring this even further now. Okay, so uh, 
the short highlights of the study, it has a lot of information. But uh, we quantified about 1,700 proteins from the discovery phase, where about 700 of them were uh, differentially expressed. And we used FOSI C uh, clustering algorithm to place proteins in clusters that showed similar response to our iron oxide or co cobalt oxide uh, material. And uh, we got these six clusters with different uh, sort of behavior. And uh, they, uh, I, I cannot come into all the uh, pathways that lies in those clusters because there's a lot of data set. I'll just highlight cluster three because it caught our interest because uh, it showed a unique uh, immune response uh, produced by neutrophils. It's a, uh, it's a phenomenon called neutrophil extracellular traps or netosis, uh, which is uh, composed by two comp uh, sets of molecules, uh, DNA actually, and, and they are histones together with a number of proteins that has, uh, um, uh, that are uh, proteinases, elastases that can break down uh, uh, pathogens because netosis is, is a phenomenon that exists uh, from these neutrophiles to combat uh, bacterial uh, infection. What we wanted to know is also when we then had our screening phase where we're running very short gradients and many samples, will we be able to also verify uh, such a uh, phenomenon and uh, we tested that and we could actually find many of the components, many of the markers for this uh, this effect. So this was very, uh, very cool. Um, we had other differentially expressed proteins and uh, they we, we placed them in this radar plot uh, showing different responses to, uh, to metal uh, iron response and wounding to uh, homeostasis and other uh, uh, GO terms. What we could uh, highlight or see, uh, because this experiment was done at two different days, so top is day one and then the bottom is day three, that uh, iron oxide induced a, a more acute response, because you can see they are they're dominating by the red shadows that, that is iron and, 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 and iron with a little cobalt, where on day three, it's more the blue colors indicating that now it's the cobalt, uh, more cobalt containing nanoparticles that are responsible for, for a, a more extensive response. Uh, lastly, uh, just finally, this neutrophil extracellular trap because I, I find it really fascinating. These neutrophiles can go to the point of infection and open themselves up as, as shown here and release its DNA and its histones uh, as a web, like Spider-Man. And then it will entrap uh, uh, microbes and uh, ensure that they are uh, digested with these uh, proteases. And in this way, it can uh, combat uh, infection in the lung. Uh, we think, and I, I'm stressing this is our hypothesis, that it, when it comes then to nanoparticle, there may be a problem. And that is uh, this uh, net ptosis uh, will not probably not be able to neutralize in the same way as a microbe the nanoparticle because it's a different thing. And uh, what what is known in the literature for chronic exposure to other contaminants is that more neutrophiles will be recruited and they will uh, open themselves and and release uh, their uh, their content. Uh, to the lung, and they will keep on as long as this uh, condition is, is, is going on. So if such a nanoparticle is sticking in the lung for a long time, we can foresee such a phenomenon. And from the literature, we know that this is, can lead to amplification of lung inflammation and chronic lung diseases. But as said, we don't have any data backing this up, but it's a potential risk as I uh, foresee. This is the last slide, and uh, I just want to thank you for your attention and patience. Uh, I went a little over time. Uh, I have a lot of collaborators that have helped me with, with the studies and, and very good students and postdocs that have done primarily all the work. 
Uh, and I want to thank also the funding agency, the EU, uh, for, for supporting this work. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Frank. Really nice uh, talk. Uh, it's really nice to see that uh, it's more information is being gathered or uh, related to, to nanoparticles. I think I know it's like a, it's a it's a major problem in Europe, uh, US as well. I think here in Brazil we don't. I, I'm not sure, but I'm not quite familiar that we, that the industries are already like mixing this okay. food. Yeah. Uh, one thing that uh, draw my attention, I don't know if you remember, this the, the first uh, paper that we published in 2014. Yeah, that drawn a lot of attention, and and I, I learned by that time that there is like a kind of a secret community of the people that get, I mean, that that really loves nanoparticles, especially silver nanoparticles. And there was this guy that was like uh, criticizing our work in the net. Yeah. And, and, and I remember that one figure, it was actually quite a clever, that uh, he said that, well, because they, sh they, they state that the nanoparticles are really good in killing uh, tumor cells. A and you, you're shown here that indeed it seems to be more toxic for, for tumor, for cancer cells. Yeah. And and most of the time, and that's actually a problem in, in like in this kind of work that uh, not us, but science does because it's, it's easier to, to handle uh, immortalized cells because they, they grow fast. It's it, it's kind of a more careless uh, cell. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, and then my point is, and, and as far as I, I was making like a small research here fast, this THLE2 cell that you use it as a control, it's still a immortalized cell, isn't it? Or, or do you know that? No, I, I don't think it is, is it? Okay, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. The, 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 my point is that, uh, no, sorry, yeah, 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 that's the one, yeah. Uh, my point is, uh, do you, have you tried or, or done this kind of work that we have already done for cytos cytotoxicity? using like a primary cells or, or non non immortalized cells to see if indeed yeah. these particles are toxic for yeah. us. Or yeah, yeah. Um, I have not tried it yet. Um, it is um, working with primary cells is, is more tricky. As you point out, it's much easier to work with yeah. uh, cancer cell lines. And, and I agree that that some of the uh, criticism we got in the review of the yeah. first papers uh, were stating that drawing conclusions from from dealing uh, with cancer cell lines and then to how this would work in or in in humans in vivo is stretching it too far and and I see the problem in that and and uh, we are aware of it. Um, uh, we have, I mean. It will be uh, of our priority list to to move it also into working with uh, primary cell lines. In fact, uh, I have a, 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 a project on the desk where we will then uh, uh, harvest cells uh, yeah. or, or tissues from uh, rodents that has been exposed to, to nanoparticles because mm -hmm. There's also something with the design of, of growing cells and exposing them. I, I think you remember that that what there's there's so many things that go on after you ingest or inhale a nanoparticle because no, it no. will it will get coated with different uh, proteins and uh, what is then the the uptake rate and so forth for different tissues. So so in reality, I, I will look very much forward to 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 get the data when we start this project to, to expose uh, rodents to these nanoparticles and then harvest uh, uh, material from, let's say, 15 different uh, organs and, and make uh, a, a, a analysis because that, that will reflect also the biodistribution and, and a more in vivo-like. Uh, but of course, the criticism could then be that uh, this is uh, this is rodents. This is not uh, yeah. uh, humans. But of course, I mean, uh, we have to start somewhere. 
So um, uh, I think it's just important that we don't stress the conclusions too far. And, and I, I think we, we are careful not to say uh, that, okay, this is toxic to humans. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but more use it as there's something that points in the direction that it could be toxic because we see this in our cell cultures. Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And I mean, an another interesting application for, for the known particles that you've shown is, yeah. is this one to treat like a blood, blood prior transfusion, right? With yeah. this magnetic nanoparticle. But then the point is, we will never be sure that the silver is not being uh, released, right? Or, or, or the metal itself. Yeah. Um, and that's a problem because we know that it can it can it, it can be released from the nanoparticles. Yeah, from the studies that we've done. It it it's uh, um, although one would consider silver as a very inert uh, 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 element because it is inert, right? But, yeah. but in the nano uh, in in the nano size, uh, we have seen ourselves, uh, but also it is documented in the literature. That there's actually quite a bit of dissolution. So release of silver. Yeah. And, uh, this is also something we 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 touched upon in our first publication with you. Uh, uh, how much of the toxicity comes from the particle? I mean, the particle itself, and how much yeah. comes from the release of silver ions? Because silver ions is very toxic too. Yeah. So, um, but I think we, we documented that uh, also in the first paper. And, and I think this is also why uh, um, it has caught some interest. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it draws a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. uh, what, one, one, one last question from my side yeah. is uh, actually two. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, if you got a conclusion, why? Uh, Giving together the, 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 the silver nanoparticle and then the cis platin uh, nanoparticle, why the uptake is increased? Did, did you see that, like uh, that the, the the molecular mechanisms, like if you up if you if you upregulate a, a transporter? Okay. Yeah, we we looked at uh, some of the trend. There are certain proteins that are good at transporting metal ions. I mean to to keep homeostasis for let's say zinc and uh, calcium and other uh, uh, metals and um, and and we were looking at these uh, metal transporters if, if they could be sort of inhibited or mm -hmm. in le less concentration and then then they would not be able to sort of uh, rescue the cell from the toxic impact of of calcium and cisplatin um, mm -hmm. As I as I recall, uh, it was not quite clear if if the regulation was significant enough to conclude anything from it. But but we had the, these metal transporters in our in our consideration. Yeah, great. Uh, I had a question here with Evozep, but Giuseppe has one. I I will say for him. Uh, yeah. Just just a, a, a curiosity. Where did you do this uh, ICPMS analysis, or or you have one home? I don't. I don't have my own. Uh, I have a, a a very good collaborator here at SDU, who is uh, basically a historical uh, chemist. So he he investigates okay. the bones and uh, 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 from old skeletons and and, mm -hmm. and and paintings and whatnot to sort of uh, understand from where they come and what 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 has been going on. And uh, uh, so he he has such an instrument. Because he needs to to quantify uh, elements in in very precisely, and when there are very little of them, but it's very useful. It's very useful in this type of research. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Oh, well, it's good that you have one like uh, in your neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very convenient. <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of people are like congratulating you, saying that like Thanks. really nice talk, and uh, Giuseppe Pizzano. Yeah. You Remember him? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, he's like uh, uh, congratulating you as well. Okay, and thank you, Giuseppe. Evosap is a very useful platform. You showed that the identification of uh, 
1,700 proteins using this platform. Uh, do you think that the deepness of this analysis can be improved to detect less abundant proteins? Um, Even though it's a problem to say that you had like six orders of magnitude, wasn't yeah. it? In that one? Yeah, yeah that, that's what we had quite from. Impressive. Quite yeah. impressive. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, uh, we don't get the same depth, of course. We, we went from, I mean, uh, in our discovery phase, we made extensive uh, pre-fractionation with Helix uh, to get the depth of the proteome. And then in our screening phase, we could not allow that because of the time constraint, right? So this was just one shot of the uh, BALF, uh, uh, BALF uh, sample. And still, I mean, uh, we went from 1,700 to uh, uh, 400 quantified proteins, which I found was quite yeah. good because many of the things that we, many of the enriched pathways that we found in our discovery phase, we could actually refine also significantly uh, with our EvoSIP system. So this was pretty cool. Uh, I think we can do better uh, uh, and... Um, this probably has to do with uh, what type of instrumentation we can use. Uh, we tried uh, uh, this preliminary uh, study with uh, a Tim's tough uh, pole, uh, a mass another type of mass spectrometer, and we actually went up to 600. I mean, for the same sample. So, um, so there are ways, uh, and I think it can become even better. But, but we had to cut some corners in this type of research if we're going to manage uh, using um, uh, proteomics in, 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 in a way where we can analyze a lot of samples in, in a limited time. Yeah, yeah. But in, in this project that I envision where we will take, let's say, uh, 15 or 17 organs, we need uh, maybe five or 10 samples from each organ and then if you have uh, this many males and this many females of the sample uh, all of a sudden you have 3,000 samples right and uh, you cannot run uh, two hour gradients of everything you will never yeah. finish yeah so uh, our aim is actually 10 minutes we will see if we can boil it down to 10 minutes yeah, yeah. in one one, uh, one so, so ten, 10 minutes one one run one sample Okay, and how long it took this one? This this experiment uh, it was it was done in four days. Four. Okay. Yeah, with everything. Yeah, okay. So I think yeah. that was pretty good too. But I mean, uh, you you had like seventeen hundred proteins for bulk, which it's it's not like cell, right? It's it's yeah. this uh, fluid. So yes. I think, I think it's quite quite good number. I would yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were. I'm quite not happy. aware about the literature, but I mean. I think it was pretty good. Uh, we should yeah. remember, of course, that that uh, um, uh, irritated lungs will uh, be more um, permeable and will recruit cells, uh, different cells, nucleo uh, sorry, and uh, neutrophils, but also other cells will migrate to the lung uh, mm -hmm. to to help the combat. So so the lung fluid will contain both the proteins of the lung. Uh, secreted proteins of the lung, but also some uh, cells, but the cell count number may not be that high anyway. So I think yeah. 1,700 proteins is quite good too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Giuseppe, add uh, one more comment, asking if you think that eye mobility could, could help in this, in this regard. Yeah, I mean, having a, 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 another dimension to it so that we don't just have... A, yeah. um, uh, uh, chromat chromatography, I think that would help. And I think that's actually why, I mean, the pink top two, uh, pro has iron mobility. Yeah, it's... And uh, maybe that's the reason why we we got 50% more, actually, protein. Yeah, yeah. There is, is like uh, Lu Luis uh, Santos, which is, he's always joining us. Hi, Luis. Uh, he's actually, he works for Broker. Okay. I mean, it's, I never had time to, to, to put my hands on it, but the data seems quite impressive with this Teams Pro. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. like... Uh, we, are, we are intrigued uh, about this instrumentation. We don't have yeah. it, yet, but uh, yeah. 
uh, we we wanted to because we had good data on our existing instrumentation. So we had yeah. we sent exactly the same sample to Boga, and, and they used also an EvoSAP in in Bremen, mm -hmm. in Germany. So everything was the same. So we could make a direct comparison. Um, I think um, we had different projects that we evaluated, and the project that I have described here was particularly good uh, with the uh, Tim's Tough Pro. Uh, my colleagues here at BNB had other projects where uh, data was comparable with what we have or just mm -hmm. slightly better. So so it. I think it also depends. I think the Tim's Tough Pro is really good when, when you have short gradients uh, and, and a high flux of eluding peptides. Exactly, exactly. Because they're very fast. Yeah, they, they are using a lot with EvoZap. Maybe like the clinical proteomics, is, it's, it's, a good, it's a good application for yeah. this platform. Uh, I don't know if you can, if you can see in, in, in the, your screen, Magno is asking a question. Magno is a professor in the, in the University of Rio. Uh, and uh, he's, he's saying that, yeah, great talk. There are some recently published work that shows identification and quantification of up to, up to 500 proteins using direct infusion without, without the HPLC, right? Wow. In DIA acquisition. Uh, and uh, in okay. field genomics acquisition. So do you think this can be maybe the next step? Should be, right? It sounds fantastic. Uh, yeah, I, I, think we, I think we've learned, right, Frank, that uh, the, the trickiest part is the LC, right? It, it yeah. is that usually gets problem. So the downtime in the instrument, most of the time, is related to the HPLC or the UPLC. Yeah. And, and we started to run more uh, LC with higher flow because it's, mm -hmm. it's less sensitive than, than yes. that. Um, I haven't heard about... Uh, direct infusion and, and this many uh, quantified proteins. But uh, the problem the problem will be that you don't have any dimension of separation. So dynamic range can be an issue uh, in terms yeah. of, I mean, you will quantify the most abundant ones. Um, mm -hmm. In plasma, for instance, there are 10 orders in magnitude from highest to lowest, right? And if you make a direct infusion, uh, I guess you will quantify uh, transferrin and albumin and, and, and other of the uh, main components. If I remember correctly, it's something like the, the, the 20 most abundant proteins is 90% is, uh, of the material. Uh, in, in that. So um, no. yeah, I think it's, it really depends also on the sample. Cell uh, doesn't have the same uh, dynamic range. It's less, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, maybe maybe with higher mobility, uh, the separation yeah. improved, but I, I I wouldn't I don't know as well like a, a dynamic range. And yeah. I, I, another problem that I can think it's like a quantitation, right? You would yeah. need to rely on on a, a, a chemical uh, labeling because you 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 don't have like a, uh, you cannot do label free, right? Yeah. Uh, you, uh, yeah, you you don't have the chromatography to yeah. to, to make and if you if you use uh, chemical uh, isotopic labeling yeah that's the one it's difficult if you isolate if you have a, if you use direct infusion you will have everything in one so if you isolate one species you will co-isolate other peptides that are also labeled and then when you yeah. fragment them and you read out your quantitation then most likely you will have uh, co-isolated peptides contributing to that and it makes it a, a little complicated uh, to assess um, the quantities. Yeah. But I mean, um, sounds interesting at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, one of the ways. I think that we are in a, in a time that proteomics and mass spectrometry. And we can also save the money for an LC. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's quite expensive too. Yeah. Oh, but maybe it, it, it's another way that we can go, right? Uh, a lot of technologies are emerging and getting more robust, and maybe this is the way. We need to make it more, sim uh, not simple, but reliable and easy to, to be applied if you want to go to clinical proteomics. Exactly. 
we need to save time. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think I think we we're, we're done. Okay. And again, to say thank you very much. It was it's always nice to to see you again, and and yes, I'm really glad that you accepted the the talk to to give a talk and say hello to to people in the PR group for me. I will. Okay. Okay, Frank. Thank you very Frank. much. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Take, take care. Bye-bye.